Well, that got you all very energized. Uh, so welcome to this session. Uh, given the importance of this issue, I personally would have wished more people in the audience uh, because we are discussing something very critical around issues that uh, have also sort of uh, been uh, spoken about again and again at this Gastein Forum, uh, health literacy on the one hand, but commercial determinants on the other hand. And I think the issue we are looking at is really at this interface between the commercial determinants and uh, the health literacy. And in the end, as I hope you will see at the end of this session, it's about power. And uh, it's very much about power. If uh, you look at uh, some of the figures, I just want to uh, mention one or two. The alcohol industry had 270 meetings with the EU commissioner over the last six years, compared with the NGOs who had 14 meetings. This means that all the meetings held regarding direct alcohol issues, 95% no, represented economic interests, while 5% represented public health interests. And so as we focus on the labeling issue, we are not saying labeling is going to solve this. We are saying labeling is a key component of this. It's also to a certain extent a test case, uh, who is going to win uh, in this very uneven battle. Of course, we have uh, Europe against cancer, and there are some very ambitious goals until 2025. You might say a word or two more about that. There are WHO action plans on alcohol. But it seems, and uh, for me again, uh, to some extent, the level of audience here reflects that alcohol is not seen in the public health debate or uh, taken forward with the kind of energy that would actually be needed. And some people don't want to touch it with a barge pole. So uh, I think uh, just put yourself in that mind frame uh, as uh, we take uh, this issue forward, because at the same time, there are opportunities. We want to grab these opportunities, and we are particularly also looking to the Belgian presidency of the European Union to help take some of these issues forward. So this in terms of framing, and uh, I have here with me on stage already Karina ferreira Borges, who deals with this hot topic at the World uh, Health Organization. And Karina, I just wanted to ask you to sort of set the scene, the stage as well uh, for people here in the room. Please do so. Thank you very much. And I'm going to move into the office, and we'll understand why very soon. OK. Um, so I will, uh, I, we thought that it would be very interesting to look a little bit backwards and uh, see what has been do done uh, in terms of the alcohol labeling in the European Union. Um, and we want to tell you, I mean, a story which is not, uh, you know, a fairy tale story. It is the reality story that started long time ago in 2011 with a directive that was very, very important and that, uh, in a way, has uh, exempted uh, alcoholic uh, uh, beverages from a very important directive that created a situation which is quite, quite, I would say, uh, very, very awkward. And I have actually been testing during this forum in Gastein, you know, the reaction of the people towards that situation. Uh, basically, what happened is that this regulation um, exempted alcoholic beverages from having a label, uh, while other uh, beverages have a label, and it's a mandatory label. So, uh, you know, I tested, you know, and I basically said, okay, I mean, you know, um, some 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 of the people that were with me, you know, and apologies for you know for doing this testing but i said you know have you looked at bottle of water you know i mean you have everything i'm sorry you cannot see it but you know there's everything there you know how many you know you know the ingredients you know the you know the 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 the, the value in energetic value you know calories you know everything it's there water yeah but then and then i said okay 
I mean, we were eating, right? I said, look, you know, we had a tutel. So look at this one, okay? So what do you see there? What do you see in the bottle? I mean, there's nothing. There's a phone number in case you would like to call them, you know? And yeah, there's a, you know, of course, uh, the only thing that managed to be kept in the bottle was, you know, the, um, the amount of alcohol, you know? So you have alcohol per vo volume. So you have 12.5% of alcohol inside this bottle. And that's about it. So you have a harmful product that has nothing. And then you have water that has everything. And if you buy one bottle of wine that has no alcohol inside, or beer that has no alcohol inside, you will have all that is here, because it's mandatory. It's below those 1.2%. Uh, 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 so we are in a situation where, I mean, this, time, 12, 2011, created a directive that exempted alcoholic beverages, harmful product because alcohol is inside, is harmful for health, out of any uh, kind of legislation that would allow consumers to have information on what is inside the product that they are consuming. So regardless of this situation, the commission was supposed to produce a report in 2014. And in that time, um, the report didn't come, 2014, there was no report. Well, what happened? Uh, it came in 2017. But just to say that in 2011, and I did a lot of also, you know, some discussions because I was very intrigued by the fact, you know, why did we come to this situation? And it seems that there were several reasons, including the fact that member states were not really interested in pushing this agenda. They did not find that it was important. And so we went through a period where, you know, all of this has been moving. We are now in 2020. 23, okay, and until today, we have no labeling proposal. Volunteer, uh, uh, volunteer agreements from the industry on QR codes that have been, uh, you know, um, uh, sent out by the um, uh, spirits industry. Beer has started to put some information on nutritional values, but nothing on the health uh, uh, harms that are part of this. So just to say, Ilona, that um, it is important that we take a look at this because we are in a period now where we can do much more in terms of really moving this agenda. And moving this agenda uh, because there is an opportunity, and it is in, under the beating, alcohol, uh, uh, beating cancer plan that alcohol should have mandatory uh, labelings. It was taken out for some reason, so it was there in the beginning. It was taken out, but still we have an opportunity to really make sure that this is there to inform consumers so that consumers can have a choice, an informed choice, into uh, drinking or not drinking alcoholic beverages when the harms which are related to that uh, behaviour. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Karina. And uh, if you actually look at Europe's beating cancer plan, it sets the target of achieving a relative reduction of at least 10% in alcohol use by 2025. Uh, that's tomorrow. Uh, so uh, given the amount of action in this area, it's probably one of the goals that uh, will not be achieved. So Karina, please come back and, uh, and join me here and uh, just uh, highlight again uh, why talking about alcohol labeling is really so important because one of the issues we always hear uh, when one talks about labeling is, you know, labeling is not going to solve the problem. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's so multifaceted. So uh, as you, so it's so complex a problem, so we don't even start with one issue. So why is this issue at this point in time particularly important? Why should people fight for this? So while it, microphone. While it will not solve the problem, uh, we have seen that is extremely important for raising awareness. Um, and we know that uh, when you have that awareness, so if you know that alcohol is a harmful product, for example, implementing other policies that we know are very cost effective and very important, will have further support from the communities. And so this is, again, you know, having uh, other lateral benefits, first of all, uh, 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 obvious benefits,
market, which is information. I'm a consumer. I want to know what mm. is inside the product that I'm consuming. Uh, but for the alcohol policy decision, it is about getting the support because you then have the support for those policies which require the community to be with you. So you have that, but you also have WHO has been issuing since 2010 in our, I mean, in the global strategy, and then later on uh, on the global action plan, WHO Europe has also the framework for action on alcohol. In all these documents, since 2010, we have been calling for labeling as part of the comprehensive strategy, exactly because, as you said, it's about health literacy. It is about knowing something which is extremely important. We know that people, women, do not know that alcohol causes breast cancer. They do not know. I mean, and, and this is extremely important for anyone who is consuming a product. Thank you very much. So as a next step, we're going to test your health literacy. And uh, there's going to be a, a Slido with two questions coming up. We'd ask you to participate in that. And while you're actively engaging with the Slido, I'd ask uh, our panelists to please come up on stage uh, so that we can start on uh, the panel discussion on this issue. You're only going to see the results later, so uh, be patient, but uh, that also means it gives all of you the opportunity uh, to uh, participate uh, in this. I'm very happy that we have uh, this, uh, this broad uh, uh, panel with uh, a lot of experiences that uh, they can bring uh, to the table. I just uh, want to introduce them. Uh, we have Frederick Woods, who is the Public Affairs Manager from Systembolaget uh, in Sweden. Uh, we have Ansela Santos, Senior Health Policy Officer from the European Consumer Organization, uh, focusing particularly on the cancer uh, issues, if I understand correctly. We have Nikhil Gokhani, the lecturer and assistant professor of consumer protection and public health law, University of Essex, who's going to help us understand some of these terminologies that are being used. We have Sheila Gilhini, uh, who's the CEO of Alcohol Action Island, uh, and uh, you will hear from them in the course of our discussions. They will put uh, different perspectives perspectives on this issue of information, health literacy, etc. So uh, Ansel, uh, I'd uh, like to start with you uh, in asking you, you know, as a consumer uh, organization uh, that has this great interest in empowering consumers, you know, you don't only want to give information, you really want to empower them. How do you uh, see this debate? Uh, you know, would this alcohol labeling be exemplary? Would it start a, a movement towards empowering consumers in a better way? What is it your organization aims to achieve here? Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, many thanks for the invitation. Um, so at BEOC, we represent 45 consumer organizations across 31 countries in Europe. And among other things, we work to ensure that consumers can make um, informed choices when they go to the supermarket. Um, but we know that in general, the knowledge of uh, consumers about the ingredients and the nutritional content in alcohol products is limited and a key barrier as we've seen um, with Karina's uh, example is that when they go to the supermarket and they checked for alcoholic beverages like wine but also spirits and others so they don't find all this important information on the label and that is a is an issue um, it is a problem. Uh, and uh, of course, from a consumer and, and health perspective, um, we consider that it's absolutely, uh, there's no justification whatsoever for the exemption uh, of uh, alcohols industry in the food information to consumers regulation. On the contrary, um, consumers have the right to know that alcohol is very, very calorific, and we will see the, the results of the, of the survey in a short while. Um, so we're talking about several calories uh, per gram, which is almost as many as uh, the amount of calories in a gram of fat. And to give you some concrete examples of what this means, so drinking four bottles of wine, 12% uh, strength a month, add up to a yearly consumption of 32,400 calories, and drinking five pints of 
uh, 5.2 strength uh, legger a week at up to uh, more than uh, 57,000 calories a year. And in addition, some food uh, alcohol beverages contain a lot of uh, saturated fat, uh, for example, let's take Baileys, um, and there can also be a lot of sugar in, in, in alcoholic beverages. For example, if you take a pre-mixed can of whiskey and, and cola. So there's clearly potential for those consumers who drink alcohol um, and who want to reduce their intake of calories, saturated fat or sugar to do so if they, they, they have this information. Um, and we know that they want to have it. Um, there's, for example, a survey that was done in 2014 showing that consumers have a big, big interest in having uh, for uh, alcohol beverages the same kind of information that they have uh, for other food products and non-alcoholic drinks. And there's also a study that was funded by the Commission and also published in 2014 um, that showed that when, uh, when consumers received information on the amount of calories in alcohol, so amongst those surveyed, 16% then said that they were planning to reduce um, their, their alcohol consumption. So these are interesting uh, findings and, well, especially taking into account that um, Europe has um, some of the highest levels of overweight and obesity and also the highest level in the world uh, in alcohol consumption per capita. Um, so at BEUG we really consider that it's high time for the revised uh, regulation on food information to consumers to ensure that consumers can have easy access to all information on the ingredients and the nutritional content in, of alcoholic beverages. And by this I mean that the information has to be on the label and we can talk later about yeah. uh, the QR okay. codes. So have you had a meeting with the commissioner? Were you one of these 14 meetings? Uh, well, at BOG we are active and we approach the obviously the the, the commission. Um, but as you say, there's a, there's a huge uh, I think difference between um, the capacity that the industry have, the resources, and and also the capacity and resources that uh, nonprofit groups uh, have. And and yeah, this but have you been in, a, in her in office? Have you spoken with her directly? Have you had the me, opportunity? We, 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 we attempt with them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so Frederick, uh, you are working for an organization that has the goal of selling alcohol without profit motive. Uh, so uh, can you explain how that is done, what the logic is, and how that is linked to consumer information? Absolutely, and uh, thank you as well for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I appreciate it uh, uh, to, and to be here. Um, System Logit, yes, it's, it's a fully state-owned uh, company, a uh, retail company. Uh, we uh, we have two main missions from the government. So the Swedish government owns us. We're a shareholding company. Uh, two missions, to sell alcoholic beverages above 3.5% with exclusive rights, so no one else does this, uh, in a uh, responsible way with good service. Uh, and also to uh, our second mission is to inform the public uh, about the negative and harmful effects of alcohol consumption. And this I mean, th these two things, these two missions, to, to sell uh, a product that is fully leg legitimate uh, and for pe that people enjoy, uh, while at the same time informing them and the public about the harmful effects may sound like a dichotomy, but uh, I would say that we've managed quite well. Uh, we, uh, we have actually the highest trust uh, among the Swedish population, uh, among all companies actually. Uh, so Swedes uh, trust us uh, with, with what we do. They find that we fulfill our mission in a balanced and good way. Uh, this gives us, uh, of course, a lot of opportunities when it comes to, to inform and informing the public, uh, because people they, since we uh, managed to sell these products in a balanced way, we, of course, we, we are obliged by, by the laws of not selling to minors or not selling to, to uh, people in, under the influence of, of any kind of, of substance, but also informing them about the effects, not uh, the individual effects, but on, on also on the society. And doing this based on research, uh, they trust that, that what we say uh, is balanced and what we say comes out well. Uh, so, uh, so here we, we have a, a, a great uh, opportunity, I think, and, and we, we make use of it and, and we can see this sort of coming back to, to the, the services that are conducted uh, in Sweden. Yeah, but do you label the alcohol products that you sell? No. Uh, so. 
one could almost sort of picture us as a platform for uh, the, the government has decided uh, to, to uh, have this way of selling alcoholic beverages in Sweden, uh, which means that we, we ourselves cannot sort of set up these uh, restrictions on, on how to label them, especially being a monopoly and being part of the European Union, as Sweden is, uh, we have to follow, uh, follow the, what, what the EU does and follow the sort of way of, of moving forward from, from the EU side. Uh, is Sweden advocating that this be introduced? Um, from the government side, uh, uh, it's a new government. I, I'm not sure what they, their sort of perspective is right now. Sorry. Okay, but so we see also, you know, a very different setup for selling alcohol, but also subject, of course, to EU law, as you said, and also subject to politics, uh, as uh, all things are. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get uh, back to that. Uh, Nikhil, I'd like to come back to you uh, because one of the arguments that uh, is always put into the discussion to try and argue for such a labeling uh, and other forms of information, of course, is the concept of the right to know. Uh, could you, particularly from your perspective as a researcher and somebody who's thought deeply about this, explain to us what is the strength of such a concept? Should one be using it or are there other things one should take into consideration? Is that, yeah. Yes, um, so what, in order to understand the right information, what we have to bear in mind is that alcohol policy falls within a broader set of consumer protection policy at the EU level. And as part of this, the, the EU has this general approach to consumer protection that relies on information regulation. So it has some rules on labeling, not very good rules, but it has some rules on information um, labeling. And what these rules are trying to achieve is to inform consumers and to empower them to make healthy decisions. So the EU has this belief, and it's had it for a very long time, that consumers will find information, they'll search for it, they'll read it, they'll understand it, they'll think about it as part of all their other information, and then they'll make the healthy decision. Right? I don't know many consumers who are like that, but that's what the EU believes. So. The EU has these rules on labelling. I'm sorry, has these rules on labelling, um, and but what it can't do. Well, part of the reason behind this is that it cannot introduce rules that are purely designed to promote consumer protection and public health. So what the EU can do is harmonise the rules around the free movement of goods and services. And in doing so, it can take a high level of consumer protection and a high level of public health. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to manage and balance trade and consumer protection. And this is where the right to information really comes in, because there's a growing momentum um, over the past few years of a rights-based approach to promoting healthier environments. Because human rights, they're, they're inalienable, they're universal, they have a legitimacy to them that other, other arguments don't necessarily have. So, unfortunately, at the, at, the, at the EU level, the rights for consumer protection haven't been particularly strong. So, if we look at the EU's Charter on Fundamental Rights, it doesn't have an enforceable right to consumer protection. But so many, um, there are so many um, references to the right. So, if we look at Article 169 of the EU's Constitution, the Treaty, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, it states that there is a right to information. If we look at Article 1 of, of the regulation that Karina's mentioned, the Regulation 1169-2011, it states in Article 1 that the consumers have a right to information. So it's odd that we have all these references, but we don't actually give consumers much information. So well, if, we look at, well, if we look at international law, uh, and this is a part of EU, international human rights law is a part of EU law, that has a much stronger framing. So this is about creating a legally enforceable right to, to information, something that would give the Commission, so almost force them, that they have to do something about this. But there's uh, another angle. Right. Very short. Okay, there's another angle, it's framing. Uh -huh. It's about the right to information, it's about framing, because when courts when, when courts assess measures, it's about what, what's our strongest argument, and our argument is that the strongest one we have is that it informs consumers. 
Thank you very much for that. And of course, if there's all this talk about the European Health Union and how it should be moved forward and the dimensions that it should have, I believe this is one of the elements that we really need to bring into this debate. I'm not seeing it in that debate sufficiently, just as health promotion and prevention are not there sufficiently, commercial determinants are not there sufficiently, health literacy is not there sufficiently, but definitely that right, not only the right to health, but the right to information linked to the right to health, I think is absolutely critical. Uh, Sheila, Ireland has moved forward. It says we're not going to wait. What's happened there? Absolutely. So um, just for the benefit of the audience here who might not be as immersed in alcohol um, as <laughs> our alcohol not. policy, I should say, <laughs> uh, as, as we are here. So um, very recently, back in May, our government um, moved ahead with a proposal, um, actually with legislation which had been passed in 2018, but which had to go through various stages. And the upshot of that is that in three years' time, there will be comprehensive um, uh, labels uh, on all alcohol products. Um, and the reason that we're able to do that is that uh, health is um, a nation or a member state competency. So, you know, just actually going back to um, uh, Frederick's point uh, about Sweden and needing to follow the EU, that's actually not the case. Um, if a member state is able to demonstrate that there is a, a compelling reason to, to take a particular action and that the action is proportionate to the scale of the problem that, that's there, you can take a particular thing. So in this case, we have been able to go ahead with this type of labelling, and the reason, you know, and the reasons that were put forward by the Irish government to the EU about this were very compelling. So, for example, when you look at the at the label there, there's. Um, there's some basic information there about the amount of grams of alcohol, you know, the amount of alcohol that's in the container, about the energy value, but there's a, a warning about not drinking in pregnancy. Ireland, for example, has the third highest level of um, fetal alcohol spectrum you disorder. You can't change your Slido answers, by the way. <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> we have the third, sadly, we have the third highest level of uh, FASD in the world. So that in itself is a very compelling reason, you know, to, to have a pregnancy warning. Other countries have that. France, for example, would have a pregnancy warning and has had that. So again, you can see that, that member states can take these individual actions. Um, when it comes to liver disease, um, we have, have high levels of liver disease. Not only do we have high levels, we have very poor outcomes from uh, liver disease. It's the one illness in comparison to other illnesses, like for example, heart disease or cancer, where we're not seeing improvement, we're seeing disimprovement. We're seeing more people with it. We're seeing more people presenting at later stages, and m more people simply dying from it. So that's that's liver, and then cancer, um, it, which is a, a really important one, and it's very important because people simply are not aware of the, the link. We would know from our own surveys that have been carried out in Ireland that about 20% of the population would have some knowledge of uh, the, the the full linkage between alcohol and cancer. In Ireland, we have about a thousand cancer cases every year and even just come back to breast cancer which you had, had mentioned about one in eight breast cancers in Ireland are um, arise as, as a result of, of alcohol so for all of these reasons Ireland you know put forward these you know yeah, th this legislation let, let me ask you Sheila I mean we have those data for many countries and they don't do anything yeah. So why did Ireland, what was the political constellation that led to Ireland taking this action? I'll say that it went back quite a long way. It goes back to a report in 2012, a commission which basically looked at what could be done about Ireland's uh, alcohol problems. Mm -hmm. And a whole set of uh, proposals were put forward. So there was a package of measures which included things like minimum unit pricing, restrictions on advertising, restrictions on availability, you know, like um, uh, you know, where you would actually see it in, in a place. Mm -hmm. And then the labelling was a part yeah. of that as, as well. But there were, it took huge amounts of effort from public health advocates to get this over the line. And the, the cancer one in particular, it was the Irish Cancer Society put it forward as, as, a, as a particular measure to, to be there. But it has taken enormous uh, levels of advocacy to, to get it passed, yeah. to get it over. 
Yeah, and I think that's a really, really important point, you know, this absolute need for advocacy, but also who actually identifies uh, with this advocacy. You know, you sort of, you need the cancer groups, you need yeah. the health promotion groups, you need the public health community as a whole. You need to say, yes, labeling is only one part, but if we take that step, we're going to be a step yeah. forward. So creating those kind of coalitions also with consumer organizations, as we've just heard, I think is a, a really, really e essential issue. Now, you've uh, seen some of the um, uh, answers uh, from uh, the Slido uh, questions. Uh, we'll show you uh, the, uh, the results uh, and uh, you can uh, see here that uh, it's, uh, well, at least the majority, what for, let, why don't you comment on these results? Yeah, um, so we can see for calories, um, yes, uh, half, uh, so 57%, so not all, but uh, half of you uh, have uh, got it right. So um, yes, uh, this is the, the correct answer. So um, still half, huh? Mm. Uh, shall we go for the la for the next one? Yeah, let's look at the next one. Okay, so yes, so almost all of you agree that uh, alcohol in the, uh, causes uh, liver cancer. Um, Female breast cancer, that's uh, very good that we could see this level here. And I'm, I, I gave you a hint, huh? so I'll, <laughs> I'll take that one, because we haven't been able to, do, to see this in the surveys that we have been doing. We did a quite large survey uh, with more than 15,000 people, and I can tell you then less than 15%, and it goes a little bit what you were saying, you know, uh, do not know that alcohol is related to breast cancer. And then we have the colon cancer, uh, which is yeah, very important, and it's good that uh, um, that this is here and uh, yeah skin cancer skin cancer uh, comes very often we don't understand why there's no evidence that alcohol causes skin cancer uh, still it comes up so sometimes we think that people just tend to say that you know it causes anything so just put skin cancer but it doesn't okay so colon rectum cancer for men particular important uh, breast cancer for female and of course liver cancer both for men and female are very very relevant so i uh, but i yeah, we have a very literate uh, audience. Well, I'd yeah? be uh, less optimistic about that looking at the previous slide. Uh, so uh, I think, yes, uh, the, the cancer, I think, uh, has entered at least the public health community thinking of the link with, with alcohol, uh, most definitely. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, on, when we just go back to the first uh, question, can you go back? Yeah, yeah. I calories. think here on yeah. the, on the uh, calories. on the calories, and you gave us some some quite <laughs> stark, start, startling figures how it sort of adds up during the year. Uh, that uh, is something I, I think we will uh, we will still uh, need to work on, uh, particularly you know if. Uh, 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 okay, it's it's good if people think it had even more calories because then you know you might be even more careful. But actually, the second is a significantly yeah. lower level of calories. So anyhow, you've all learned something in this session, so uh, that's a good thing. Because this worked so well, we're going to do another Slido. Uh, we'll put up the questions, but uh, while this is happening, I want to give one or two of you the opportunity uh, to ask a question uh, if there's something you'd like to understand better. I knew Vesna was going to ask a question. Why didn't I say, Vesna, ask your question? <laughs> <laughs> Vesna, please. I'm so sorry, I, I will ask the question. Uh, it's because I've been around for so long and I'm getting so impatient, sorry. Listening to what the colleague from Sweden said from Monopoly, I got really seriously worried because I know why he said what he said, because he is misled. That is what people are saying. We can do not, in my country, for example, no, we can do nothing because European Union d doesn't do it. Look at the Ireland, they do it. It's not true. You can do it, whatever you can do 
it. We should start speaking of, you know, informing uh, society not only on what alcohol does, because I think everybody now understands that it has harmful effects. Maybe not in details, but they do get it, you know. But why is it that they don't understand that alcohol is pushed on them? Why don't they understand that there's somebody who earns money on them? We did this in, with tobacco. That was the message. It was not the message you'll die because of tobacco. It didn't work. But it was the message, especially to young people, that somebody is earning money on you. Somebody is manipulating politics, everything, to get it right for them. So why don't we openly say that, you know, we are losing against the lobbies that are there that want to earn money? We should discuss this. We can be skilled because we proved with tobacco that we can do it. Mm -hmm. Public health can do it. Not alone. We have to ask, for example, organized young people. I see someone there that is chairing this session. She's from Slovenia. She was grown up with advocacy of young people to support me in the Ministry of Health to get it right in certain policies. So that is how you do it. I don't know, in Ireland you said report. Yes, we had hundreds of reports. You must have somebody who really took it seriously and tried to get everybody around the table that supported him or her and did it, you know. It's not that simple. We had report and then we have strategy and it's done. It doesn't work like that. Thank you. Thank you, Vesna. Sheila? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I would say that there was the, um, it was the CMO the chief medical officer who produced that report and was known to be a very, very determined individual. And that, without doubt, in fact, he was, as it happened, he was the same CMO who led us through the pandemic. And I think the public, for the first time, actually understood the role of the CMO when they saw that and they saw his determination around that. Um, but even with such a, such a CMO, um, what was needed was advocacy from multiple different angles. So from, from our perspective, we started an alliance of about 60 organizations, for, uh, which included people from uh, Women's Council, um, because we were talking about links with domestic violence, included things like the Cancer Society, Heart Foundation, um, children's organizations. So there was multiple different voices. And it uh, that legislation covered many different things. So when when certain things were being, being discussed, so maybe, for example, advertising should be uh, on the streets close to schools, we were calling on the people in the children's kind of sector or the education sector to make very informed points that we would have briefed uh, people on. When we were talking about cancer, we ha handed over to the cancer experts to do that. But there was an enormous amount of knocking on politicians' doors. Um, and I would always say, funny enough, we were just saying, you know, did you get a meeting with, with the commissioner? Yes, these are very important meetings to get, but actually you need to start local. You need to start with, so from a European perspective, I would be saying you need to be knocking on the, the doors of your local MEPs and making the points and drawing out the data that's relevant to that individual politician's home constituency and trying to make make the points, you know, through that. I I, I didn't mean to gloss over in any way. Oh, we had a report. And, whew, hey, Presto, we got that. It did not happen like that. <laughs> and, and not only that, that report came out in 2013. You will not see these labels till 2026. So that'll give you an indication of how much work. And in fact, who knows what might even happen before that. But I, I would... Thank you, Sheila, and that indicates what uh, we had said earlier, that uh, you know, the interesting thing about alcohol is that it touches on so many lives, on so many issues, and therefore, if you do organize and organize well, as you indicated, you can have everyone from women's groups, violence groups, health groups, etc. But it needs a strong focus. And I think in your case, again, we hear how important chief public health officers, chief medical officers can be in moving an agenda forward. So why is Sweden not doing this? Yes. Sorry, uh, I well, I, I'm really not representing the Swedish government, <laughs> and and uh, I think that your question should be actually pointed to the Swedish government rather than, than me uh, as myself. I, I fully understand the situation, and I'm not well, going to consider myself say, misled. Yeah, no, not <laughs> any government, but you heard there was a yeah. community movement. Of course, and, and we see that as well. Is there a community movement in Sweden against alcohol? Like 
uh, we, we see an increase, and uh, sort of uh, jumping on, on what Ansela mm -hmm. mentioned before about what consumers want, we, we see that, of course, we see an increasing, as in many countries, an increasing sort of wanting, uh, consumers wanting to know more about what mm -hmm. they do and, make, and being able to make health conscious uh, choices. And, and that is, of course, raised uh, in our stores as well and, and with us as well. Uh, but sort of uh, being, being an alcohol political tool, as we are, and uh, doing retail, uh, we, of course, sort of, it has to trickle down from, from the government and they, they have to sort of to point the, the direction on, on what uh, to do and not to do uh, and, and these uh, sort of questions on, on how to, whether or not to put labels on. But we have are, we sales are gone up or gone down? Um, so we, we had, uh, during the pandemic, since uh, no one had, uh, we were able to travel, uh, we had a slight increase, but sort of uh, after the uh, pandemic, we've seen it's gone uh, mm -hmm. down uh, again. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's sort of, and consumption, of course, it follows the trend as in many countries, it goes uh, down. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So thank you for that. I do have to press on now, I'm sorry, but I hope I can bring you in afterwards. Uh, let's have the next Slido question. So uh, we were asking you whether you, know, you had used the new type of digital tools that are being introduced, and, uh, uh, it's, uh, and it's one of the strongest arguments around the QR codes. Uh, so again, uh, I'll hand over to you to do some commentary and some introduction to this strange QR codes business. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, talking about being misled, right? Uh, so in, in total agreement, Vesna, that, and again, what I said, 2011, there was an opportunity for member states, for advocates, for civil society, and they were not there. And this is why we ended up in this situation. So it's time now, because it's in the beating cancer plan, to really have you know, another voice, not only at the EU level, but then it's also, because Ireland is leading, a time for all the countries to really move in that direction and take that decision, and it can be done. QR codes, yes, totally misled. So this is a common argument, again, you know, the solution provided by the industry to, uh, um, to say we will do what is necessary to provide consumers the information that they need. What we did was we did some research on that. We uh, did a study with retailers. We're very thankful for retailers working with WHO uh, that allowed us to do this study. What did we do? We basically uh, used shops and we have, um, it, during one week, we went to a supermarket. We put uh, there on, a, you know, um, a QR code um, on, um, so a kind of a sign, a very large sign on point of sale. So like we have for tobacco, huh? on point of sale with a QR code and basically saying, I mean, you have all the information if you would like to know. So we said alcohol harms your health and you have QR code for more information. And then we tested by having that, so not in the bottle, because it was not there, uh, but having that, what would happen? And how many people would look into and use these QR codes? Because they, it was available, the information there. So what we saw is that only 0.226%, so 0.2% of all the people that bought some alcohol, of the people that bought alcohol, okay, looked at the QR codes, 0.2%. From all the people that entered the shop and had this information and could consult QR code from uh, you know, harms due to alcohol, only six out of 7,000 people looked at the QR code. So this is a usage rate of uh, less than 0.08%, so less than one per 1,000 persons. So this is the validity of this, and of course this is a preliminary study, but basically it shows that codes, that uh, you know, QR codes will not reach uh, the amount of people that uh, would reach uh, people if the information was yeah. on the label. We're going to see a video on this as well in a minute, but we had a second question, I believe. Uh, let's uh, um, hear, uh, QR codes can replace information on product 
labels, well, yes, you took your own experience <laughs> and you said, uh, disagree. It won't replace it. You're not going to run around with your smartphone and uh, continuously uh, open up QR codes. So let's see this video to have a better understanding of this QR movement. about that. Uh, can I ask you how many of you were aware of uh, this uh, QR discussion around labeling in general and alcohol labeling? Who was aware of it? One, two, three, four. So it shows how important this discussion is, and thank you very much to WHO also for taking this uh, on uh, this, uh, this agenda. So uh, there were a couple more people who wanted to raise uh, uh, questions and issues. Uh, so I think, uh, Vitenis, uh, please introduce thank yourself you. to this group because thank you're an you, important Rona. person. Yeah, I have one question, more, uh, maybe more general to all of the community. You know it was excellent Court of Justice decision about this case, because the court of justice decision is a very good instrument to use it in all countries. My question is, are you capable to disseminate such a message to all public uh, communities that can press the, the governments, parliaments to use court of justice de decision acting in the same way as Ireland or as Scotland, you know, because it is a really, really illegal instrument. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that leads, Ansel, to a question to you. You know, how much is this discussed in Brussels right now? How aware are people of this issue, also knowing how to take it forward and also the legal uh, attempts at strategy that, that are happening? Could you say a word or two about that? Yeah, so there's a clear push from the alcohol industry to um, to, to provide uh, information through um, only through QR codes. Mm -hmm. And um, so from our perspective, if we want to ensure that consumers can make informed choices uh, when they go to the supermarket, it's, it's important that the essential product information is on the label. So it has to be at the point of purchase. And um, at Beuk, we, we are not against um, digital means of information, uh, but our position is that, first of all, they have to be these QR codes um, privacy friendly. Um, and they can only complement, uh, but not replace, complement uh, the label, uh, for example, with, uh, by providing information that could be a bit more superfluous, but that consumers might want to check when they're at home, like, for example, the, the history uh, behind, you know, some uh, wine producer or uh, cocktail recipes, um, but information about the ingredients and the nutritional content must be on the label. Um, and it cannot be the case that alcohol producers um, can decide, as it is today, which essential information they provide, to, uh, to, to which extent, um, and, and by which uh, means. And, and I'm going to give um, three reasons of why moving essential product information online is a no-go. So first of all, it takes too much time. Um, decisions at the supermarket, when we go there, we take them within seconds. Uh, we, we go in, we get our things, we go out. And it's unrealistic and unfair to expect that people will take out their phones, scan the QR codes, and then have the time 
time to navigate through these websites to find the information that they are looking for. These are time pressured environments, so they for, information must to be uh, handy. Second, when we talk about QR codes, we are talking about connectivity, also ownership, smartphones, and digital skills. So here, even if there have been improvements, access to internet remains fragmented across Europe, and according to Eurostat, 20% of people do not access internet through their phones. And even when we do, it doesn't mean that consumers will all the time go to the supermarket with their phones, that their phones will always be charged, that their mobile subscriptions will be functional. Um, and we th if we think about the uh, older people, th they face more challenges, and not because they have maybe a smartphone, it means that they will be able to use it in, in all the different contexts and, and situations. Um, and the third, um, QR codes make it uh, impossible to compare two products at the supermarket. So sometimes we go there and we want to compare product A or B, and this is easy if the information is on label, but it's very difficult if you have to scan the QR code and then find information, memorize it, then go to the other product, scan the QR code and remember the information. Um, so that's going to be very difficult. And if, uh, there's no surprise that our um, German member, VZVV, found a bit in line with the, the results of this survey that only 5% of consumers use regularly QR codes to check uh, food information, whilst 57% said, 58% that they, they never do it. And I just want to wrap up by mentioning a review of the Joint Research Center, uh, which uh, concluded that providing information um, on food products only digitally seems risky because you know some people might uh, be willing or able to access uh, uh, and use these QR codes, but not everyone. So we are excluding some people, and and that's risky. Yeah. If we want we'll to ensure, of course. We'll come back to the equity uh, question in yeah. a minute, Mirka. You had. Uh, yeah. No, 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 no. She was for a long time. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I know I'm preaching to the converted here, but I really want to go back to the discussion on the role of advocacy uh, in, in reaching the, the goals that we, that we set here. I think the figure 20, 270 versus 14 meetings with the commissioner tells us all about the balance of power. And the only way for us to counter the vested interest is to empower civil society really at all levels. And again, I think we don't need a reminder in this, in this audience when we are talking about civil society, these are committed people who believe in what they do and who do it for, to stand for the cause, uh, and often for peanuts and, some, and often voluntarily. So we really need to invest effort into empowering civil society through capacity building, through financial support. I thought it wouldn't have to be repeated at this forum, but it has to, because also because we have had some disconcerting comments, also very high from the Commission at this forum, in this meeting, this is, which is also disempowering to civil society. So I just wanted to kind of stress well, Can you give the example? I can. Um, the DG of DG Sante, uh, Sandra Galina, has made a comment about civil society not having capacity to handle large uh, amounts of money or large budgets offered by the, by the Commission. And that, after having us on a short leash, this, uh, how shall I say, disadvantage to other civil society groups or other, other civil society sectors, making us, you know, like, um, invest effort into advocating for funding for something that is given to other civil society sectors uh, uh, in, a, in a very normal process, while at the same time we've been delivering, and delivering big time. So I thought, I thought that was a very disconcerting comment, Thank you. which shouldn't have happened at this, yeah. uh, at this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important, this lady and then here. Please, shorter comments if possible. I want to get back to my panel. Um, hi, uh, I come from Hungary where alcohol is also a big issue and I have two questions. One is about the expression labeling. Are, you, are we talking only about telling the ingredients or telling that it is harmful as we have seen on the Irish label? This is my first question. And the second is when we did the labeling on tobacco and Hungary was really very good in that in all the tobacco le legislation. We did not have to fight some cultural issues. And I am asking Ireland, because you also have a tradition of drinking, as we do. We do wine, you, do, you drink, uh, we drink wine, you drink whiskey. How did you tackle that issue? Thank you. OK, several questions to Ireland coming up. Prepare yourself, Sheila. And over here, please. All right. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Stefan Tomek, Integrated Arts Group, Eco Wellness. Um, 
we started to certify organic wine farmers um, who reduce alcohol and reduce histamine because this is also a very important uh, thing. Uh, and uh, also um, from the negative side and also uh, tried with uh, our science, uh, scientists uh, to help them to produce more resveratrol in red wine. So from this angle, I think this should also be a new angle to go step by step, improving especially the organic sector, the organic wine sector, because uh, as they are not allowed to use herbicides, pesticides, etc., etc., already, which is healthier than other wines, uh, I think uh, we should focus on this and get more support by the WHO and all organizations for this, because our problem is uh, nobody uh, knows these possibilities that equivalence as a standard, which <laughs> implements, uh, apart from organic uh, things, uh, health uh, supporting things and social social things and, and ethical things. Mm -hmm. So we Thank are not uh, un Unilever and Nestle. Yeah? We are against them. <laughs> okay, uh, we hear there are different parts of the industry and that there are innovations in the industry and you might afterwards want to say a word or two about that and you know where those innovations and particularly if there is labeling, they could show how different they are. Uh, that would be an opportunity. Sheila, a number of questions to you, but also if you could sort of in three and a half minutes also include the equity issue. Okay, so a couple of things just very quickly. There are two strands to the labelling issue in Europe. There is the nutritional information, as in what it, what's the calories, what's the contents, what's the ingredients, and uh, there's proposals being worked on, but honestly, they're a bit in abeyance. And then the second one is on health warnings, which is solely really about uh, cancer warnings. So the two are kind of moving in parallel, and they're really being dealt with in two different ways uh, th through, um, through, through the Commission, um, which is unsatisfactory and... That, that's all I can just say, that it, it is unsatisfactory and it does need kind of working on, on both simultaneously. Your other question was um, in, you know, to do with um, the, the, the culture in the country of um, you know, where we're at. The people are ahead of the politicians on this. People know we have 15% of our population in Ireland have an alcohol problem. That means there's hundreds and thousands, millions of people in our country whose fa who individuals and families are affected by alcohol. So we would have seen polling data, for example, just on the labelling itself, 70% of the population were firmly in favour of um, having the, this information. Polling data like that is very useful to be able to bring to politicians to say, do you know something? This is, this is a no-brainer. Our opposition is not the public. Our opposition is the industry. Uh, on this and we need to be making it very clear to our politicians that actually people want uh, support there. From an, an equity point of view, I, I'm, I'd say most people who are in this room will know that alcohol disproportionately affects those in, in lower socioeconomic uh, de demographics and we see it in all sorts of different ways in terms of health outcomes but also in terms of the environment that you get more uh, alcohol outlets for example in, in, in areas of, of deprivation uh, as you do with uh, gambling outlets and, um, and, and, and unhealthy foods so there's all of these things that are there. We have seen from MEP in Scotland for example that the introduction of MEP actually had its greatest effect in terms of reducing deaths within that, that, that cohort. So that's a very powerful argument that we would always make that actually introducing, you know, um, alcohol control measures actually has a, a disproportionately, a good effect rather, I should say, like on, on fr from, a, from an equality point of view. I hope that covers yeah, everything. Thank you. That was very informative. And it takes me uh, uh, back to Mikhail with uh, this, because there are different ways of using this term proportionality. We heard it here. It disproportionately affects uh, uh, poorer people, disadvantaged people. It has effects on uh, all other uh, people with less power. But uh, in Interestingly enough, you know, this uh, uh, notion of lack of proportionality has become an issue that the industry has, has put uh, forward. Uh, what is meant by that? How do they argue? 
Yep, so this is a very complicated area of law, but I'll give the simple version. Um, proportionality is essentially saying don't try to crack a nut with a sledgehammer. So measure must be not got too far, it must be in proportion to um, what we're trying to achieve. But if we dig a little bit deeper, proportionality, the principle, um, has two limbs to it. One is necessity, the other is suitability. So if we look at suitability, and we look at the suitability of um, labelling, particularly warning labelling, what we know is... The, what, Firstly, that is, it's for the national courts to decide. So when these measures are challenged, so if, if, if Ireland is challenged in court, it will be for the Irish courts to decide whether a measure is proportionate. So, and they have, the national courts, a degree of flexibility to take into account scientific uncertainty, particularly for measures that haven't um, been tested on a mandatory basis before. So there is, there is some, there's some openness there. But what suitability is trying to look at is whether it achieves its, its objective. So does labelling inform? And yes, it does. Firstly, as we've heard, there is, a, there is a deficit. There's a deficit in consumer knowledge. And we know that labelling informs consumers. This is, this is nothing, this, is, this cannot be disputed. This, is a, this has been the core of EU law for decades. It's, it's what every organ of the EU has stated very openly. Labelling informs. And then we look at necessity. So this is trying to think about if there are multiple different things that a member state can do, and one is less or a few are less intrusive to trade, then the member state is required to choose the less intrusive one. But that only applies where the measures are equally effective. And there is nothing that is more as equally effective as labelling. As we've heard, labelling is available at the point of purchase. It's available at the point of consumption. Mass media campaigns, healthcare interventions, none of these are equally effective. And so it's for the national courts to decide based on a reasonable um, analysis of the evidence. And under that, I think proportionality is satisfied. I don't think we're going to face major hurdles there. Thank you very much. I think that's an important information for all advocates, you know, and to follow through on that, how one can construct an argument, and also to be informed about how the other side argues. There are some questions that have come in uh, from uh, uh, colleagues who are online, and uh, there is, you know, this question, I'm going to put it to you. Uh, how strong is the alcohol industry in Europe as a political actor? How can one answer that question I, as WHO? I mean, I, you, you showed some numbers, right? Yeah. I mean, 240 or 70 against 40. Huh? How strong uh, can this be? I mean, but it can be even uh, stronger, not only at, uh, at the commission level, but also with governments. I mean, you were talking about, you know, taking this to uh, to European court, but it costed a lot of money. It costed five years of a fight to Scotland to make it. And the only thing that was, that was wanted was to protect the health of the population. So do we need to spend money of contribution which could be handled to a house in a court fight to prove that this is a needed measure when the only thing that we want to do and the prime minister wanted to do was to protect the health of the population. So are these the behavior that we expect from economic operators in a country? I mean, yeah, that, that's a question. And this is again about, about power, right? <laughs> Thank you. And, and the other thing that I would like to say about this is, okay, I mean, economic operators have a role. WHO has set that role very clearly in the global action plan. As producers, they do have a role. They do not have a role in the policy making. They're not health actors. They have a role as producers. Like any other sector, economic sector has contributing to, you know, the different functions that they have in society. And there's a lot that can be done. I mean, it's not up to a health institution to define what the economic operator is going to do in their function, but there are, they, there's a role that can be explored and that we hope that economic operators will not go against governments that want to protect the population, but align their businesses 
to a health, with a health focus, not a harm focus, but health focus in line of what the population and what the government is seeking to do, which is to protect the health of the citizen. And I just wanted to say something about, I mean, something that Sheila has uh, 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 hindered and that you said, which is it's very dangerous to have two discussions that are not following in the same direction, which is the information and the nutrition discussion cannot be separate separated from the health discussion. Because we have been seeing, WHO has a technical advisory group that brings people from all over the world where we're seeing these discussions on labeling. And what we are seeing again is a tactic from the industry that basically is portraying, using the nutrition and the ingredients uh, labeling to say, this is healthier. So there are now labels saying, this is healthier product because it has less, less sugar. And the, the health warning are not there. So I think that it's a plea that we do not move this agenda separately, that we really come together to make sure that, that the consumers have all the information that they need. They do not need only information on the sugar content, on the calories, on the energetic and nutrition. They need information on the health harms that alcohol causes, and they are huge, huge. So this is a plea. Thank you. Thank you, and that's very, very helpful. You wanted to add something really short? Very shortly. It's just like I, I agree with Milka. Civil society um, plays a crucial role in this debate, but we need support. And I, I fully endorse uh, what Milka said, that it needs to be supported. Thank you. I think we all agree on that. There were some uh, other questions here that I don't see anymore, uh, but uh, uh, there was one issue to say if we're discussing, you know, this labeling, if we're discussing the QR codes, uh, doesn't that lead to even putting more responsibility on the individual uh, in relation to a problem that is truly social and that is influenced through marketing and all kinds of other commercial determinants? Uh, if I go back to Sweden and your responsibility, how do you try uh, to balance that? You know, the information component, you hinted at some environmental components, which are obviously, you know, how easy is it to have access to alcohol and things like that. Can you place that in a, in a way? Uh, sorry, in, in like balancing in the way we how inform? How do you balance or? the information, mm -hmm. the, uh, how do you try to avoid putting all the responsibility on the individual? Uh, yeah, and, and this is may, might not be a sort of specific communication uh, thing that we do, but we, we structure our, our stores, for example, so that uh, the, it's always the shortest way through the store. You don't spend too much time in the store. You should always see the cashier. Uh, so you move uh, quickly and uh, do not buy more than you sort of intend to. Um, we have different ways in the store that sort of nudge uh, the consumers to uh, uh, be able to, to leave uh, products uh, at the cashier uh, if they feel that they don't want to buy this so they shouldn't be pressured to buy it. We don't have buy three, pay for two uh, campaigns. Uh, so, so uh, and this might sound strange for a, for a company, but that's, that's because it's in our role and it's in our mission. Uh, not to uh, make people buy more or consume more. So we have our ways, and also in, on, in, on, in our online store, we, uh, we don't have any campaigns or uh, maybe you should buy this if you want to look, in, in, look into a certain product. So we, we definitely do things to sort of help consumers also to buy less. Thank you very much. We're at the end of this session, but before we close, uh, there was another um, a question here, and uh, again, I have to turn to WHO, uh, because we've not talked about alcohol advertising at all. Would you like to say something? Sure. Uh, so. Evidence is, uh, is there. Uh, we know that by being exposed to alcohol marketing, uh, we change our behaviors. Uh, children start to drink earlier, uh, and also the way that they drink uh, is changed. So there is more harmful patterns of drinking by the fact that you have been exposed to alcohol marketing. Alcohol marketing is everywhere. We are very concerned with the new ways of marketing to children, the new ways of marketing to young people uh, that are very uh, 
uh, I mean, are out there, uh, especially in the digital sphere, not being able to be controlled uh, as they should be in terms of protections of children. And, um, and we know that this will have an impact in terms of the behavior. So indeed, it is extremely important to address. WHO has been calling for restrictions and even total ban on alcohol marketing as a way to protect uh, the, the population and, the, you know, and to bring uh, the changes that are needed. Thank you. So maybe there's three or four messages to take from here. We do need empowered com uh, consumers. Uh, we uh, obviously, the solution to this issue are not QR codes. And I won't go into any detail. I think we've discussed this in, in a very good way. I think we do want to see the alcohol issue as part of a European health union that is responsible, that puts the health and well-being of Europeans first. And uh, I believe uh, Gastein can and should be a forum. It is already working towards a European health union. And this dimension of the European health union that's not really on the agenda yet is something. I think all of you should take the point that was mentioned earlier also by Vesna. You have to create a movement uh, that uh, answers to this political power and pressure that gives a signal uh, to uh, the Commission and also to member states. And please remember, there are European elections coming up. Please do work locally, find out who your MEP is, and uh, make, make sure that they are aware of this issue. I think this is my personal opinion, but maybe you also want to give this message. I think the European Health Forum, Gastein, has a great opportunity opportunity of being an advocate uh, for this movement. And there have been meetings on this issue at Gastein uh, regularly. I think we should push it higher on the agenda. I definitely will do so as vice president of the forum. But I think it would be important that those of you on the panel and in the audience who think this should be an issue to take forward uh, are uh, also give this message, you have to do some evaluation of this session, uh, so that's a message you might want to give, but also in other conversations. Now, we are very lucky, and I ask you to stay on for two more minutes, that the former Commissioner for Health uh, is with us, and he wants to give you a last message. Uh, please, please, please take your phone. My single tennis. message, not to go to the court, but because it's costly, but please you Use Court of Justice precedents in your countries, pressing governments, national parliaments, and local parliaments, because it is so important too, you know, to, 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 to achieve, uh, you know, results. Because it's, please use it, because it's such Court of Justice precedent means that it's, 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 it's uh, legally binding to all in all countries. Please use it, not to going through code, but to going to direct your actions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Vitenis. And it shows that takes courage. There was a time when there was a very courageous uh, health commissioner in uh, the commission. Uh, no names will be mentioned, but they are here. Uh, and uh, I think that is also something we should keep an eye on, that uh, the uh, appointment of the however things are divided up in the end, that the commissioner responsible for the European Health Union, and we have even spoken, there should be a vice president that's responsible uh, for this, uh, is a very, very important appointment. And we should keep our eye on that. We should be advocating on that. And we uh, should be very outspoken about that. So thank you very much for your patience. We've overdrawn a little bit, but we did start five minutes late, so we're totally punctual, and uh, have a nice lunch, and take this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you.